Good morning and uh, welcome to Duke and for many of you, welcome back to Duke and to our conference. There are an awful lot of familiar faces here. Uh, I'm Scott Silliman, uh, the Executive Director of the Center on Law, Ethics and National Security. Uh, and as many of you know, this is the 12th conference that we have put on, 12th Annual Spring Conference, uh, that always focuses on some specific and hopefully topical issue in national security law and policy. Let me suggest that although our armed forces remain engaged in combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq at this moment, that's clearly not the only front in a war against terrorism. Individuals and groups in this country, in Europe, and elsewhere continue to plan and execute terrorist attacks like this morning in Baghdad to promote their own interests. And in those attacks, they exact a tremendous and tragic toll in human life. The threat of further attacks has prompted a very public debate about how best to identify those threats and to deal with them. And that, deb that debate necessarily involves both domestic and international law and policy. Uh, we encourage you and invite you to be a part of that debate over the next two days uh, with your questions and answers of our panels that we put together and also the three individuals who will be speaking uh, at the two luncheons and the dinner. Let me mention a few administrative things to you. First of all, all the panel sessions will be right here in this auditorium in Janine. Uh, for those of you who have signed up for the two lunches and the dinner tonight, they will be over at the Thomas Center. Many of you who parked in the Thomas Center parking lot walk through that dining room area, and that's where we will be for our lunch today, uh, tomorrow, and for our evening dinner tonight. If you look at the program, you'll see that there is a reception, a uh, hosted reception prior to the dinner tonight. Uh, and that's gonna be at the Duke Law School, which is just down the street. Now I've taken the liberty of changing the program. Uh, that cocktail hour, as you see it on the program, starts at 6.30 with dinner at seven. I've decided that's not enough time. So I am going to change your program and the cocktail party at Duke Law School will start at six o'clock. That will give you time to at least not only see the law school, but to savor the hors d'oeuvres uh, and the wine and other beverages that are provided at no cost to you down at the law school. So if you will recall then that when we adjourn this afternoon and if you are coming to the dinner tonight uh, to hear His Royal Highness, I'm sorry, to hear uh, Ben Powell, uh, then you're cordially invited to join us at the law school for a cocktail hour at 6, not 6.30. Uh, we've structured each of the six panels today and tomorrow to allow for at least 15 to 20 minutes of questions and answers. My experience in the last 12 years has been that some of the best dialogue takes place when you get the opportunity to ask questions and make your comments to the panelists. Uh, I want to ask you to do one thing though. If you have a comment or a question, uh, we have two ladies sitting down here in the front uh, who will have wireless microphones. And if you would stand, if you have a question or comment of the panel and wait until they bring you the microphone. We are making a transcript, an audio video transcript of the entire conference and we want to make sure that we capture your comment or your question. So if you'd wait and when you have the microphone, please identify yourself so that the panelist answering it will know who you are. You've been given a packet of materials and in that packet of materials, um, is not only a program, a brochure about the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security, but also an evaluation form. Uh, we read them. I particularly read each and every evaluation form and try to improve these conferences from year to year based on your comments. So please, um, as the conference proceeds, and if you have any thoughts about anything, whether it be the food, the facilities, the panels, the speakers, anything, please let us know because we do seek to make these conferences better and better. Lastly, uh, there are three ladies out front at the registration desk, Eileen Wojciechowski, uh, Dana Norvell, and Donna Gano, who came down to help us from the University of Virginia. Uh, their function is to try to make your brief stay with us as pleasurable as possible. So if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, if we can take care of any arrangements for you, or if you just uh, 
uh, want a cup of coffee that you can't find. Those young ladies out there are the, for the purpose of helping you have a better time at our conference. And now, uh, what I'd like to do without further ado, uh, and to stay right on time, sir, is to turn the podium over to our first panel and its chair, Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University. Bruce, over to you. You all heard that comment? Well, I'd like to say that all of you should be intimidated this morning because we have on our panel someone who has a PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Professor Eng Sang Ho is only slightly blushing because he knows that, of course, he's even more to be feared than Kurt Vonnegut, and he's alive. Uh, but he's also alive with some other people we have on our panel who I think you're going to find interesting who also sport um, interesting uh, PhDs from Oxford and from Princeton. There's even one from Berkeley. And I have to admit that mine was earned at Yale. So you don't need to be afraid of me. But I am going to try and keep this uh, panel more or less online and to do what uh, Scott Silliman asked, and that is to give you time for Q&A at the end. I always want to say, though, at the beginning, that when you think of Q&A, remember the Q&A is question. So if you have a comment to make, think about it, and then turn it into a question before you get the microphone. And I think we'll have some talks that will provoke questions. And we're going to go in the order. And let me introduce uh, the whole range of whom we're going to hear and then tell you um, one by one who they are. First of all, it's Abdusalam Magawi, uh, who will be followed by Charles Kurzman, who will be followed by Miriam Cook, and then by the feared successor to Kurt Vonnegut, uh, Professor Eng Seng Ho, uh, who, who got his PhD, as you may recall, from Chicago, but teaches at Harvard. <clears throat> so, and then if there is any time left, I will have some remarks. But if, there, if it comes up to the hour where it's only, uh, it's, it's, it's roughly 10, 15, because you have a 15 minute break, remember? I think Scott said that or should have said it. There's a 15 minute break after our panel before the next one. Um, if we come up to 10, 15 and the last of my speakers is not done, I will end uh, Professor Ho. I'm not afraid of Chicago. I will end his talk and I will not enter my own. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Abdusalam Magawi, whom you know from your schedule as the director of the Muslim World Initiative, the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, and then by Professor Kurzman, and then by Professor Miriam Cook, and then ending with Eng Seng Ho, Professor Eng Seng Ho, uh, and perhaps with some follow-on comment from me. So without further ado, let me begin with Professor uh, Abdusalam Magawi. Please. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this timely and important conference. I am honored to be here. Uh, I just want to clarify that I'm not speaking as a member of the U.S. Census of Peace. I'm speaking as an independent uh, scholar, and therefore my views are my own. Uh, with that disclaimer, uh, the title of my topic is The Drawing on Islam to confront Islamic extremism. And the, mo the main point of my uh, talk is that we need to get out of the irreconcilable argument that Islam is either a religion of war or Islam is a religion of peace. That is going uh, nowhere. I think we do need to recognize the religious sources of the violent conflict in the Muslim world. However, I think we should also make an effort to explore the potential within Islamic discursive traditions of confronting extremism and uh, uh, confronting uh, terrorism. A major premise of the debate over confronting uh, terrorism these days is that Islam actually condones violence. The argument is that Muslims ethically tolerate uh, uh, or support violence because authoritative Islamic texts, the Quran, the Sharia, uh, the Hadith, the sense of the Prophet, say so. The implication is that really Islam itself is a source of the problem not just some extremist interpretations of Islam by Muslims uh, on the fringes. 
There are, of course, objective reasons why this uh, 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 premise has gained ground. For one, Islam, like other uh, monotheistic religions, has its share of glorified violence, of hellish uh, retribution, and uh, apocalyptic events. One cannot overlook the impact or the influence of this divine imagery on a, a, a people, especially when they use it to justify uh, uh, violence. A second reason why Islam has become uh, a focus is that the argument that link extremism and terrorism to social, economic, and political uh, conditions seems to have been challenged. Other areas of the world are suffering from the same challenges, and yet we don't see uh, ideological extremism or violence in the same manner. And diversity of nationalities, ethnicities, social background, uh, age, gender of terrorist recruits really shows that there's no one single social or economic uh, uh, explanation. Another reason why Islam has become a, a, a focus of, of, uh, of, uh, 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 of investigation and linked to extremism is that different Islamic agents, regardless of their size, regardless of their strategies, regardless of their objectives, are using the banner of Islam to uh, justify their acts. Small groups like Al-Qaeda operate in North Africa, Central Asia, Europe, everywhere. They do justify their acts referring to specific verses of the Quran. Islamist political parties with a nationalist agenda, such as Hamas in the Palestinian territories in Palestine, uh, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, various Sunni and Shia group in Iraq today do use the uh, banner uh, of Islam. And large religious movements. So we are moving from groups to political parties to movements like Taliban in Afghanistan, the Diabandi groups in, in Pakistan, and the Muslim brothers in Egypt at some point, they all referred to Islam as justification or the use of violence to establish strict uh, Sharia. So when all is disentangled, the single factor that keeps coming up is reference to Islam and religion. But what if violence is indeed related to religious issues in the Muslim world, but the connection between Islam and, 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 and violence is misleading. What if extremists do ju find justifications in the Quran, in, the, in, in various sources of, uh, of Islam, but that doesn't mean that Islam provides no potential, even greater potential, for peaceful existence and, and, and tolerance? How would a counter-terrorist strategy would look like if we think that, in fact, using Islam's progressive principles is more efficient than promoting democracy or certainly the, a war or uh, uh, reforms? So these are the kind of questions I would like to, uh, uh, to address. Can you just have my So what I would like to argue is that the best strategy perhaps to, to confront extremism and terrorism is in the Muslim world is by reviving Islam's humanistic progressive traditions by referring to the writings of progressive Muslim philosophers, religious scholars. And that is the best hope I think we can have today for confronting uh, uh, Islamic extremism. But to realize this potential within Islam, I think we need to cut through the confusion that we make between Islam and, and uh, violence. So to set the background behind this idea of reviving Islam's 
progressive and humanistic traditions, what we call Islamic renewal, let me begin by raising a hard question. An Islamic renewal to revive Islam's progressive tradition might take decades. It could, moreover, involve esoteric debates that totally escapes the international law, policy-making world, and it's hard for the United States or the Western powers to do anything about it. And we are not even sure what the outcome of this Islamic revival or renewal might be. So why take the risk? Why does not follow the, the usual the standard package of political and economic reforms and uh, to limit extremism? I sympathize with that view. However, I think that it will not work given the tremendous ideological crisis that, that is going on in the Muslim world. I am skeptical about this standard package of economic and political reforms for three reasons. I think first, we have to recognize that the nature of the conflict in the Muslim world is ideological. And this conflict has been going on for centuries and it was exacerbated in 1979 following the Iranian revolution where the Sunni regimes felt threatened by the dynamism and the energy of the Shia revolution and they responded by their own brand of Sunni uh, 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 fundamentalism, especially financed by Saudi Arabia and with the Wahhabi uh, 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 thinking. Wahhabism was very limited prior to 1979 to very few places in, in Saudi Arabia. By the late 80s and the early 90s, it was really, it has spread to various parts of the Muslim world. So the point is that the major battle today is really about the soul of Islam. It is an ideological one and should be uh, recognized. The other reason why I am cautious about political and economic reforms alone as really uh, efficient to limit uh, uh, extremism is that under current conditions, free elections can only bring theocracies or controlled elections might bring liberalized autocracies. These are the same regimes in place as we see in, 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 Mor in Morocco, in Algeria, in Egypt. They give a semblance of reforms, but they do not confront the real deep problems that, is really, that exist within their societies. So while I caution against the, what to expect from, from immediate political and economic reforms, I don't dismiss the social and economic factors as a, as a source of extremism and, and, and terrorism. However, what I'm saying is that at this point, it is too late for free elections and economic reforms alone to confront the problem. This is really a deep ideological crisis that necessitates rethinking within Islam itself the role of religion in life, the role of, uh, of minorities, gender relations, and those substantive issues are not going to be settled through the ballot box. Historically, if we look at Europe, these issues were never settled through the ballot box. Basically, from 1450 to 1945, that is 500 year period in Europe, there were periods of wars. There were bloody conflicts surrounding these basic substantive issues. And I think it is helpful to have that historical perspective to think of the Muslim world going through the same, uh, the same uh, uh, crisis. I'll just give you a concrete example of why free elections not, don't necessarily, uh, uh, are not necessarily the, 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 uh, the solution. Even though I am saying we should not, we should just be aware of the limits of it, not to, to, to cancel uh, democratic elections. A few years ago in Morocco, a coalition of secular parties presented a plan to reform the family code to give women more rights. The two Islamist parties mobilized huge demonstrations in Casablanca against the plan. 
they simply refuse it as some, some that, is, that is inappropriate, not, that is not incompatible with, 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 with Islamic principles. The political parties that, that presented the plan, we drew it, thinking about the electoral results, that national elections were going to take place within two months. They were concerned that they were going to lose bad if they maintained the plan and they withdrew it. It was um, the monarchy, an unelected institution, working with civil society, working with religious scholars, working with unelected bodies, that basically pushed the plan through the, uh, the, the parliament. And the lesson here is that free elections might work for certain issues, the redistribution of resources within society, certain, certain uh, the question of taxes or schools, uh, defense spending, they, will, they are not good set to settle normative issues such as the role of religion in, in public life the, or, or, or gender uh, 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 equality. So let me define what I mean by uh, Islamic renewal and uh, to discuss the, val the viability of, of this movement as uh, uh, a form of, uh, to confront uh, extremism and uh, uh, develop uh, toleration. The idea of Islamic renewal, as I said, is best understood in comparison to the Christian Reformation. It is a, a movement to rethink the basic institutions, practices uh, uh, in Islam, to make it more compatible with modern life. And this effort involves both social practices and reinterpretations of, of, of text. And we have various people working in, in this, uh, very figures in the Muslim world working in this, uh, 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 in this movement. But the analogy with the Christian Reformation really should be taken uh, uh, cautiously. For one, as we know, Islam does not have a church that needs to be reformed and does not have a pope against which religious scholars are going to, uh, uh, to uh, rebel. I mean, second, the, the whole history of the Christian Reformation itself is not as smooth and, and linear as we think. There are various moments and, uh, uh, and there are various Christian Reformations, not one. Finally, we should not expect that the Islamic renewal or reformation within Islam will necessarily have the same outcome. That is a separation of church and state or the, uh, that the individual rights will emerge as a higher good than collective right. However, I think it is possible through an Islamic reformation or renewal to have a tolerant, peaceful Islam that can live peacefully by it, with itself, but also uh, uh, with the West. Uh, during the period of discussions, I will give you examples of who are exactly the forces that represent this Islam. And I think the, it's, it's, uh, uh, their voices, unfortunately, have been neglected because they don't make it to the, the front line of, of, of the media. But there are numerous circles. One group, for example, those proponents of Islam and democracy, various groups that see no incompatibility between Islam and democracy. That's, there we have groups of civic Islam, those who call for the respect of human rights, for the environment, for the, for the property, and you, even though they don't have any political ambitions, we have Muslims living in the diaspora in the West who, who see no co contradiction between being a citizen of France or the United States and Muslim identity. So we're talking about really a vast, <coughs> diffuse movement that, has, that is not coherent at this point, that does not have platform, does not have a, a common objective. However, it is there. It is, it is an anthropological reality and, and it exists. And it also has actually political supporters. There are most of the moderate political parties that participate in the political process, I will consider as partners in this Islamic renewal and uh, uh, as well as even traditional Islam. Traditional independent Islam, these are traditional figures that are independent from the state that lost their power, but they still exert a lot of cultural influence. And historically, traditional Islam has been very tolerant it grew within urban cities like Fez, Marrakesh, Kairawan, Cairo, and they have, uh, they have co they coexisted with various groups, Jews, very small Christian minorities. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of potential within the Islamic discursive traditions, within uh, Muslim life, to think about the idea of, of tolerant, uh, peaceful Islam. 
So let me just stop there, and I will be happy to address your questions later. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me uh, here today. Um, my name is Charlie Kurzman from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, down the road. I teach sociology and Islamic studies there. And I'd like to speak to you today on the topic of why there are so few Islamic terrorists in the world today. This may sound counterintuitive, of course, but I'll try to offer evidence, number one, that there are very few, and then some sort of explanations or analyses of why there are so few, and perhaps a couple statements about the implications for some of the issues that I gather you all will be dealing with uh, in the rest of this, this conference. Let me start also with two apologies. First is I have to run at 10.30 to make another appointment back at Chapel Hill. I apologize for that. The second is I was going to show you a beautiful PowerPoint uh, uh, display with, uh, you know, disconnected bullet points and illogical uh, jumps, leaps, and things that are common to PowerPoint, but my computer just broke, so I will not be showing you that. And instead, we'll be doing this largely from memory, uh, so you will not be able to check my sources or my accuracy of my quotations or figures. I have free reign to make up anything I want. <laughs> not really. The, the, the idea today that in, in, at a conference on terrorism and on strategies against terrorism that we need to be, learn something about Islam is I gather why we're, we have this panel here and I'm happy to participate and to help share some of, of, of what I've been studying and to hear what uh, these other experts uh, have been studying and what they have to say. Uh, let me point out though that this is historically contingent and, and probably fleeting that in a generation from now, if there's a similar sort of conference, it won't be Islam and why Islam is associated with terrorism, it'll be some other group or ideology, just as a generation ago, there was, no, it, there was no association in the public mind or in the government policy world between Islam and terrorism in the 1970s. It was leftist groups were the ones who were doing lots of the terrorism. Uh, suicide attacks or suicide uh, expressions were associated with Buddhism in Vietnam, not with Islam. A generation before that, uh, terrorists were communists. Uh, terrorists before that, a generation or two before that, terrorists were anarchists, and there's an association with anarchism and atheism with uh, these kinds of acts. These things change uh, every generation. Islamic terrorism today has learned from these earlier waves uh, of use of this particular tactic in order to gain its own political uh, ends, to, uh, to, to uh, engage in warfare uh, by unconventional means. But let's not pretend that there's any great association or any permanent association between Islam and terrorism these days. Muslim suicide bombing as a specific type of terrorism only emerged after other groups in the Middle East had pioneered the use of this tactic in the late 1970s and early, early 1980s. The first suicide car bombs in uh, Beirut, for example, were carried out by Armenian and Kurdish leftists not anything to do with Islamist uh, uh, ideologies, and were later adopted by various Islamist groups, only in the 1980s. At that time, various Islamist radicals, revolutionaries who want to take over governments, adopted an Islamic ideology that said that individual martyrdom, uh, striving in the way of God, uh, jihad, it is incumbent upon every individual Muslim as a religious requirement. So you begin to see in the 1980s, not that long ago, in the 1980s, the emergence of an Islamic literature that says that every individual, every good Muslim should be engaged in this battle and ready to give up their lives. That it's not simply defense of Islam and the creation of a, a proper pure Islamic state. There have been movements uh, along these lines for many generations, but the idea that each individual is required to take up this duty, that's a relatively new argument. It's associated with people like Abdeslam Farag, uh, the theorist of the group that assassinated Sadat in Egypt, and then later um, uh, Abdul Azam, the Palestinian activist who helped, who was one of the big uh, coordinators of the Islamic movement against the Soviets in Afghanistan in the 1980s. They're making these arguments and they're saying 
that it's not simply good enough to give money, to lend your support in, in, uh, in intangible ways for jihad. Rather, you have to give your life. You have to give over your body and soul for this movement. Now, before we think that this is entirely alien to us, I'd have to ask, and I do ask my students, well, when they, we get into discussions about uh, martyrdom, and it gets us, so they say, well, that's an Islamic thing. I can't imagine us doing that. Uh, but, but I think it's not quite so foreign to uh, our consciousness. It's worth looking at the, the areas of overlap. For example, if you ask the question, are there any causes for which you'd be willing to give your life? Well, I, we could probably come up with some, that there are causes that, for which martyrdom would seem like a, a noble option. And of course, in, in the US, we are, are all taught as children to, to uh, respect Nathan Hale's comment that I have regret that I have but one life to live, give. <laughs> Sorry, one life to live is the soap opera. One life to give <laughs> <laughs> for my country. And that they're in, uh, I gather, that in military training, uh, that you're supposed to put the mission first and to put your, uh, your core first. And at, there are times when you would be asked to risk or even sacrifice your life for the core, and that acts such as that are respected and valued and given special uh, commendation. What's interesting, though, is that after a generation of Islamic claims, and bin Laden, uh, whose messages to the world were edited by Professor Lawrence here, uh, and make fascinating reading. Bin Laden is only the latest in a series of people since the 1980s to say that every individual Muslim ought to be considering giving up their lives, mobilizing to give up their lives for the cause of, of revolution, Islamist revolution, to establish an Islamist state. After a generation of this, relatively few Muslims have obeyed. And this is what's fascinating. Out of the world's billion Muslims, why are there so few Islamic terrorists? The number of transnational terrorist attacks, according to the MIPT, the National Memorial Institute for the Prevention of Terrorism, uh, which has a database that those of you who have wireless here can look up, called the Terrorism Knowledge Base, tkb.org. The number of transnational attacks, the ones that we're worried about, these are defined as attacks, uh, uh, uses of violence, by two or more individuals against an, a civilian uh, target that cross some international boundary where either the victim or the perpetrator has crossed an international boundary. This is not domestic attacks. We don't have very good historical databases of domestic terrorist attacks around the world. But for transnational ones, this database collected by the RAND Corporation starts in 1968 and it shows that the highest number of these attacks was in the 1980s. These were not Islamist attacks largely, they were largely leftist groups, some national liberation groups, went down somewhat after the Cold War and then have gone up again over the last several years, but only to the same level where they were in the 1980s, which is several hundred of these a year. Now don't get me wrong, every attack is a horrible, a violation of human rights and a terrible thing. And I do not mean to be downplaying the, uh, the, the, the horribleness of these, these events, the atrocity. I condemn them entirely. My point is simply, if we're trying to get a sense of the order of battle here, what kind of threat are we facing? We're talking about relatively few attacks and we're talking about relatively few people. If you add up the number of insurgents estimated to be in active in Iraq, which I've heard from newspaper sources citing military briefings is approximately 20,000, on the order of 20,000. And we add then the military wings of other Islamist movements around the world. A, a conservative, that is a high estimate, of the number of active either terrorists or people with some terrorist training this would include the 10 to 20,000 people estimated to have been trained in camps in Afghanistan under uh, the uh, era of the Taliban, would be something around 60,000 to 100,000 people. This work works out to something on the order of one in 10,000 Muslims around the world, out of the world's billion Muslims. Now, national 
nationally oriented as opposed to the uh, globally oriented Al-Qaeda movement, nationally oriented movements such as Hamas and Hezbollah have a somewhat higher rate of recruitment in their catchment populations, something on the order of, and this, again, the estimates are really crude, but something on the order of one in a thousand rather than one in 10,000. This is comparable to the scale of recruitment for other revolutionary movements that we've witnessed around the, the world over the last roughly quarter century, such as uh, the uh, provisional uh, Irish Republican Army, uh, ETA in the Basque movement in Spain, which also are mobilizing somewhere around uh, between one in 500 to one in 3,000 of their population as members, according to public estimates of the, the size of their recruitment. The most successful, though, and an entirely order, different order of magnitude, is the Tamil Elam movement, the Tamil Tigers, who have mobilized something on the order of one in 100 Tamils in Sri Lanka to be members of, active members of their military organization. What I'm trying to do with these comparisons is not, and, and all these comparisons are flawed uh, because the denominators are so different. A billion Muslims around the world is, is quite different from a, a small minority population on an island, uh, in the case of Sri Lankan Tamils. But rather to say that the, the revolutionaries have not been all that successful in mobilizing Muslims for radical action. This has been a source of ongoing frustration and annoyance to the Al-Qaeda uh, spokespeople. Uh, and most recently, uh, Ayman Zawahiri, the Egyptian medical doctor who is bin Laden's uh, right-hand man. Uh, his latest, uh, one of his latest broadcasts uh, issued out over the internet uh, says, you have no more excuses. You Muslims have no more excuses. All the possible excuses are gone for you to get involved. And he goes on and on. He's quite frustrated. He's, at the same time as he's saying, oh, we're about to win, you can read also in his, his, his remarks a sense that, that he is extremely annoyed that Muslims have not been more active in, in responding to his call. That's not to say, I mean, th that the small numbers can't do great damage. I don't mean I need to repeat the obvious here. Uh, Al-Qaeda has the same credo as Margaret Mead, that you never doubt that a small number of people you know, can change history. In fact, that's the only way history ever changes. We see clearly that they're willing, there are small groups of people willing to get involved in these acts uh, of violence, even though they're, they're relatively small in number. But what's interesting, they want to get big. These, they want to be a mass movement, and they have failed to become a mass movement. So why have they failed? I'm going to offer three bullet point type suggestions about why they have failed. One is the Muslim backlash against terrorism. After 9-11, virtually every Islamic leader in the world issued a statement denouncing the attacks and denouncing Al-Qaeda for having committed them. These are often overlooked. And in fact, you get people such as Tom Friedman saying, why haven't Muslims spoken up against terrorism? Well, they have. I've collected dozens of these statements because I got so annoyed that people were not reporting them. Uh, on my website, it's, the title is Islamic Statements Against Terrorism, and you can probably Google it and find it relatively easily. Most of the world's Muslim authorities are hostile to acts of violent terrorism. And as Dr. Magrawi has already noted, there are other trends within Islam that are in direct competition with the most violent forces trying to create revolution and willing to spill blood to do that. These include traditionalists who want nothing really to do with the state, just want to be left alone, pietists who want to renew Islamic society through hearts and minds, not through taking over the state, Democratic Islamist movements who want to take over the state, but want to do so through the ballot box, not through revolutionary violence. And then even within the revolutionary Islamist movement, there's huge numbers of divisions about what targets to attack, whether to attack the, uh, the Muslim regimes, 
or to attack their foreign supporters, whether to attack civilians or government officials, which government officials are considered okay for attack and which ones are not. A huge amount of division among the Islamists. Second, the politics of prudence. Most Muslims do not want to die, regardless of what you may read about their urge to martyrdom and so on. Most Muslims are as practical and prudent as everybody else. You need to be reminded that throwing away your life on a political cause is not a particularly Muslim trait, just as it's not a particularly American trait or any other group. Only a relatively small number of people ever get involved in political activism, and especially in risky political activism, and a context where almost every country in the world is on record as opposing terrorism. And in most, almost all countries, you'll get arrested very quickly and sometimes treated very badly if you're suspected of being involved in any kind of Islamic radicalism. The third analysis, I would say, of why there are so few Islamic terrorists is something that I'm calling radical chic as a pun. It looks better on the PowerPoint, S-H-E-I-K. <laughs> An ideology among considerable number of young Muslims that bin Laden is to be supported because he's anti-imperialist and because he's at least standing up to the West. But these are people who do not want to see bin Laden actually, or his ilk, come to power in their own countries. And we can see this, for example, in the bin Laden t-shirt, which was selling for a time in Southeast Asia and uh, West Africa and some other places where wearing a bin Laden t-shirt is sort of a self-undermining statement because if bin Laden were actually to come to power, he would probably ban graven images and maybe even ban t-shirts. So to, and to wear a bin Laden t-shirt is sort of an odd and statement and, and no terrorist would actually call attention to themselves in this way. So my feeling is if somebody wears a bin Laden t-shirt into the airport, they are not a security risk. You should just let them right through onto the planes. The fact that the people were buying these, and you can see this in web postings and uh, uh, internet uh, forums and so on, Muslims who are support, say they support bin Laden in one way or another, but actually uh, have all sorts of stuff on their signatures, say a uh, link to the, uh, 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 the band Coldplay in one posting that I've seen. Uh, it's a British progressive rock band. Uh, it would not be associated necessarily with uh, an Islamic state. Uh, or another that has some Lebanese pop singer as their uh, icon for their postings, and the postings are saying, our sheikh, the noble mujahid, the noble struggler, uh, Osama bin Laden. I have to think that, that some of this support then is soft. It's not easily convertible into radical action. That he's a symbol for radicalism in the same way that, say, Che Guevara is a symbol of anti-establishment thinking among American college students who wear a Che t-shirt or have a Che poster, even though they have no knowledge of or interest in the socialist revolution uh, and Stalinist, Stalinist type administration that he actually stood for. In conclusion, I'd, say, I'd like to say that Muslims are restraining themselves in the war on terrorism. The United States and our security policies are seem to be of decreasing importance in, the, in affecting the amount of terrorism that we're going to see that it's this largely a Muslim problem and that Muslims have been solving it and they will continue to solve it, hopefully uh, continue to do even better, that the demand curve for U.S. security policy might be extremely inelastic. That is, no matter what we do, Muslims are going to do the same thing. That's the terrorists are going to do pretty much the same sorts of things. As a result, I would say that some of the stuff that you're going to be considering in the rest of your uh, conference about security policy, uh, please keep in mind that the effectiveness of these policies has yet to be proven. And so if we're going to figure out which extremes to go to in terms of, say, interrogation and um, monitoring and surveillance and whatnot, uh, let's keep the other shoe, uh, uh, the other part of the equation in, in mind through all of these, which is that the effectiveness of these uh, extreme measures has yet to be proven. I thank you very much for your time. I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Good morning. So it's always fun to follow Charlie, always controversial. 
So maybe there aren't many Muslim terrorists, but I would submit that they do terrify those few, and they terrify us, but not only us, they also terrify their families and friends. No one is more aware of the danger of Islamists and their political and militarized ideology of violence than Muslims themselves. Um, the um, Jordanian ambassador to um, Washington, um, His Royal Highness Prince Zaid Rad Zaid al-Hussein, um, was talking with us last night about the uh, dangers of takfiris, the, um, this is a term that's used for um, radical Islamists. That's a term I'll be using um, for Islamic fundamentalists. And um, I think it's really important for us to realize to what extent not only is it us who um, are concerned about, about these uh, Islamists, but as Charlie said, it's also um, Muslims themselves. But no one is more aware of the problem of this ideology that calls for the establishment of what is called the Dola Islamiyya, or the um, Islamic State, that entails the imposition of Sharia, Islamic law, than Muslim women in the communities that are under threat of having this law imposed. And the reason is, of course, that women are key to the Islamization of um, societies. I say that because um, Muslim women have long stood in for their communities. Um, they are the ones that are the most visible, both within the community and to the outside world. And so Islamists in particular, particularly those who are calling for the um, imposition of Islamic law, have been very concerned about um, Muslim women's appearance and behavior. And women, Muslim women around the world, have been resisting the, um, these Islamists. And so in the past 20 years or so, a number of um, Muslim women's groups have been established to call for their rights within Islam. This is what I refer to as Islamic feminism. And I'd like to quote uh, Zaina Anwar, one of the founders of the uh, Sisters in Islam movement from Malaysia. And um, she said um, fairly recently, if religion is to be used to govern the public and private lives of its citizens, then everyone has a right to talk about religion and express views and concerns on the impact of laws and policies made in the name of Islam. The fact that Islam is increasingly shaping and redefining our lives means all of us have to engage with the religion if we do not want it, Islam, to be hijacked. So in, um, I think it's um, interesting to um, look at the role of the um, information revolution in the increasing role of women in Islamic societies. So obviously, as you know, m the mid-1990s marks an important point in the um, information revolution. And this information revolution, and when I talk about that, I'm talking about the World Wide Web, uh, satellite television, cell phones, um, created a new space for Arab and Muslim women's voices. Networks that had been in place uh, from the 70s and 80s became much more connected um, after 1994. I'm thinking in particular of the network um, called Women Living Under Muslim Laws. And they put together a program that I think is still ongoing called Women and Law. Now this Women and Law program brought together women from all over the Muslim world, so from Indonesia to America, and obviously through Asia and Africa, to consider issues of concern to women who were not only living under Islamic laws, but those who were facing the imposition of a more strict form of Islamic law. Al Jazeera, founded in 1996, open, founded, launched in 1996 in uh, Qatar, 
became a very important um, source of information and sort of mobilization for um, Muslim women's rights within Islam, particularly the program that um, was run by um, Sheikh Karadawi's wife entitled Women and Islam. And what this program did, Jazeera in general did this, of course, was to overcome the kinds of barriers that within Arab countries um, had been in place, and that is the control of the media. So satellite television, of course, overcame the control within these countries, and um, suddenly people, women in particular for the purposes of what I'm speaking about today, were able to hear authoritative voices on international global television um, I'm thinking particularly of the program Women and Islam, but many others. And of course, the World Wide Web allowed for a distribution of information that before was unavailable. So going back to the women living under Muslim laws, the kinds of problems that a woman in Somalia might have um, could then be um, distributed so that women in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, um, Brazil, could see that the problems that they had were ones that others had and that um, solutions were being found by women who were trained in um, Islamic legal studies. The next step, of course, is 9-11 and the consequent Islamophobia, where um, Muslims were othered. And of course, we have the story of the Afghan women. Afghan women, um, almost immediately after 9-11, although they had been sort of in the background from 1996 since the establishment of the Taliban regime, after 9-11 became our hope for the preservation of civilization. I'm quoting, of course, Laura Bush's speech of November um, 2001, where she took over the radio address of uh, President Bush and talked about the need for us to save Afghan women from their men um, in order to save civilization, very much the kind of colonial discourse that I'm sure you are familiar with that the British used both in India and um, Egypt particularly. So what we then have is the resurgence of the veil. I'm not saying that this is a return to the veil because this takes a long um, historical background, but basically the veil that emerged um, after 9-11 is, um, I think, a new phenomenon. And I'd like to quote from um, Fawzia Afzal Khan, um, a Pakistani, woman who has um, put together an extraordinary book that I recommend to you called Shattering the Stereotypes. And in it, she talks about what she perceives and also all the women in this anthology or edited volume that she's put together, what they perceive to be a new homogenization of the Muslim woman. In fact, I refer to this in an essay that um, is coming out soon as the Muslim woman, just one word. And I would like to um, quote briefly from her words. And she says, when I was growing up in Lahore, Pakistan, in the late 60s and 70s, I had no idea I was going to become a Muslim woman. This, la this label did not envelop me then as completely as it has of late in the post 9-11 USA. Muslims in general, and the Muslim woman, capital letters, in particular, have suddenly been handed the starring role in the post 9-11 drama of the new century. Now, um, this interest, fascination, um, with the veil is um, something that Asra Nomani, um, a Muslim woman who has written a very um, controversial book, um, Standing Alone in Mecca, has called the veil fetish. And 
this veil fetish I'd like to just briefly talk about in connection with publishing. Because whereas before 9-11, for a Muslim woman to get herself published was a little bit difficult, a bit of a feat. It became a little easier in 1990 after the Gulf War. But after 9-11, as um, some have said, um, the Muslim women's story has become worth its weight in gold. Beforehand, it was like, a Muslim woman or an Arab woman, what can she, what can she tell us about? We all know her story. And now there is much greater interest. So on the positive side, this means that the US public for the first time, I think, um, I say the first time in a sort of broader sense, the US public is becoming aware of Arab and Muslim women who have long been calling for women's rights, um, the organizations that I've told you about, um, women living under Muslim laws, Karama, there are many of them we're beginning to hear about the kinds of struggles that women within these Islamizing um, communities are having. We are hearing about women within Islamist organizations, and I would like to suggest a book to you that came out fairly recently called I, Nadia, Wife of a Terrorist, an extraordinary story of the wife of an, what is called an emir, a, but a leader in the uh, GIA, the Group Islamique Armée, which was the military branch of the FIS, um, the Islamic Salvation Front in Algeria. She tells her story of being brought into this organization and you get an inside view into one of the most um, brutal Islamist groups um, that, of course, ruled the Algerian countryside, but also the, the cities um, during the black decade of uh, 93 to 2003. That book has just come out. Um, another book that came out last year um, called Baghdad Burning, written by Riverbend. Uh, Riverbend, uh, a uh, nom de plume or nom de blog, of a um, of an Iraqi woman who writes in very articulate American slangy high English. It's wonderful. Um, from August 2003 to September 2004, she follows the reactions of the ordinary Iraqi to what's going on on the ground. And she conducts what I have called a multiple critique. So you can see how people within, on the street, the men and women on the streets of Baghdad, how they're reacting, how they're criticizing the Islamists, the Shiite Islamists, the Sunni insurgents. Um, she has sweet words for Brenna, Brema and, um, all the leadership, um, but very much reflecting what's going on on the ground. And we now have access to that because, of course, of Amazon, you'd so that these books then get around the world. There is, of course, though, um, the downside. And the downside is something that I'm particularly concerned with, and it goes back pretty much to Laura Bush's speech, I'm afraid, and that is the promotion of Muslim women who will tell the inside story, but unlike Ay Nadia, wife of a terrorist, it is not the inside story of Islamists, of individuals, not many of them, as uh, Charlie says, the, the individuals who are proponents of violence, but rather these stories are about how Islam, a nice abstract, huge category is in itself um, violent and uh, destructive and particularly targets women. And these stories, and I'm thinking particularly of Ayan Hirsi Ali and her book Infidel that is now being promoted all over the country, um, Azar Nafisi's Reading Lolita in Tehran, 
hugely supported by um, state money, and both of them highly articulate. For those of you who've seen them, uh, elegant, beautiful English, soft-spoken, telling about the horrors of Islam. And, of course, the problematic promotion of this kind of uh, insider story. And uh, Oprah helping out, of course. Um, of course, though, we have other Muslim women, and I'll go back to um, Fawzia Afzal Khan, who are very concerned about what has been happening and trying to show how Muslim women are trying to change the society from within. And she writes, I aim to weave together in this anthology, this edited volume, I aim to weave together different strands of conversation that have been taking place between women from diverse Muslim backgrounds since 9-11. I hope for that something, I hope too that something new and dynamic can emerge from this recognition of a shared space and trajectory despite differences in outlook, culture, temperament, expression, and yes, the different relationship we each have to the concept of Islam and its place in our lives and identities. So there may not be many Muslim terrorists, but as long as we stay in Iraq, their numbers, I fear, will grow. And we'll need others um, as partners in the war against these terrorists. These Islamic feminists understand better than anyone else the implication of Islamic fundamentalism, and they have a platform for change. Along with those whom Hassan Hanafi ca calls post-fundamentalists, and Charlie gave us a list of um, others who are these post-fundamentalists, I would submit that these women are potential partners in the war against terror in the name of Islam. Thank you. Good morning, can you hear me? I'd like to thank uh, Professor Scott Silliman for inviting me here, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here uh, bright and chipper this early morning. Um, I'm going to speak to you, uh, today we're dealing with uh, difficult issues, difficult issues of policy, and um, I'd like to suggest that these difficult issues also have to do with issues not just of policy, but of international law, and even uh, political theory. Um, in that sense, then, it is um, a great pleasure for me to speak of these issues which I've been thinking about in the uh, context of a law school. So thank you. I especially appreciate that um, invitation, and I think the intimidation goes the other way. Um, <laughs> In the past uh, few hundred years since, I guess I would say, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, it has been uh, customary that civilians have no role to play in the conduct of international relations. Since Westphalia, international relations have been thought of as relations taking place between states. So other actors, such as merchant guilds, roving bands of uh, mercenaries, uh, even bishops and popes, uh, since that time, uh, thought of as having no legal personality, 
in the realm of international relations and therefore no legal standing in the conduct of international relations in the um, dialogues which take place in international law. Uh, so there has been the case for the past uh, few centuries. Now, in the past um, couple of decades, however, we have seen that civilians have uh, been involved in international relations, and especially as casualties of war. And more recently, we've seen that civilians also have uh, taken on roles in the conduct of warfare itself. And this is what we are thinking about here today, issues of um, terrorism. Now, I don't really have um, answers to these questions, but I'd like to raise some questions from uh, a reading of newspaper events or of events on newspapers, on the internet, and so on. And um, I'd like us to think about some of these issues of uh, civilian uh, participation in international affairs, in international um, law. Now, one of the uh, consequences of saying that civilians have no legal standing in international law and international relations is that civilians have no voice in these issues. And in that sense, I'm happy to come uh, after um, Professor Miriam Cope, because she has just shown us the extent to which, number one, Muslim women have not had standing in these realms, but on the other hand, in fact, have huge roles to play. And I would take this argument uh, further to talk about civilians uh, in general, not just women. Um, and so the issue then is if civilians don't have a role in international relations, international law, uh, how but civilians have been involved in these things, how can civilians speak, who uh, speaks to whom, and if we are talking about um, relations across divides of violence, how is it possible, or is it possible to find an interlocutor on the other side? So what is the possibility of dialogue, of interlocution, and how might it be possible to find interlocutors on the other side of these violent uh, divides? So let me try to uh, speak about these issues uh, following just one event, okay? And the event we will look at uh, is the train bombings in Madrid in uh, March, on March 11th, 2004, what the Spaniards call their 3-11. So on March 11, or 311, uh, 2004, uh, we had huge uh, bombings in the Atosha uh, train station in Madrid, the main train station in Madrid. Uh, powerful explosions on the day of, um, this is from the BBC, on the day of the explosions, uh, it was said 173 people were killed. It turned out to be 200 plus. Uh, near simultaneous blasts. Uh, immediately upon this thing happening, no group has admitted responsibility, but Spain's government blames the Basque separatist group. There is no doubt ETA is responsible, says uh, Spain's interior minister. <clears throat> so huge blast, 3-1-1-2004. Now, this uh, attack happened three days before Spain's national election, which was uh, going to happen, I think, on the 14th of uh, March. So the immediate questions which came up were, who did it and why? And the Spanish government's answer was the ETA Basque separatists. Of course, the other uh, possibility was uh, Islamist terrorists, and the Spanish government said, no, not Islamist terrorists. ETA Basque terrorists. Um, what hinges on this question of who did it and why? Uh, let me go back a year before this train blast uh, to speak about the larger international context in which this is taking place. So if we go back a year, 
what we have is the run-up to the current Iraq war. As you remember, there were debates. President Bush went to the UN and so on. So there's a huge run-up to the Iraq war. And on February 11th, uh, 2003, uh, bin Laden comes up on, I think, Al Jazeera and uh, condemns the uh, looming war on Iraq. And he, in fact, gives Iraqis um, advice on what to do. So he is claiming a presence in this sphere of international relations at this point. Let me just try to play a clip. It might not work, but we'll try. So um, one interesting thing which is going on is that he's establishing his, his presence on this stage. And um, there is pretty much a consensus among security experts that this is bin Laden's voice. One of the strange things in this very technologized world we have today is that the human voice is very difficult to imitate. So this, the human voice is, is, is much better than, a, say, a visual signature in terms of uh, saying who is speaking. So it is pretty clear that this is Bin Laden is speaking. He's giving, um, staking his claim to being a player uh, in these events. Now let me just uh, give you a little translation. And for this, we have to thank our own uh, Professor Bruce Lawrence, who uh, has put out, published, and edited uh, Bin Laden's statements. Uh, so this is a translation of what we've just been hearing. Um, he says, we are following with intense interest and concern the Crusaders' preparations for war to occupy one of Islam's former capitals, loot Muslim riches, and so on. So he's making a claim to his uh, participation in these events. And he goes on to say that uh, last year, uh, when we were attacked in Tora Bora, we took shelter in the earth by digging trenches, and he goes back to early Islamic battles in which trenches were, were dug. And he says that because we uh, dug trenches, we were able to absorb the uh, bombing capacity of uh, the American Air Force, and we were able to survive. Um, three persons per trench, and he's saying to the Iraqis, you can do the same thing. So he is very clearly establishing his presence in these series of events. Now, just to give you a sense of how far this message spread, uh, let's go to another part of the world. And here uh, we have um, the T-shirts made famous by Charlie Kurzman half an hour ago. This is a photo from Indonesia, and this uh, report is from Al Jazeera, based in Qatar. Uh, and it says the message of bin Laden, the message of bin Laden 
is now uh, involved in um, relations between Europe and America. Bin Laden is trying to make a divide between Europe and America in the run-up to the Iraqi war. And um, this is a person who is selling uh, posters of Bin Laden, posters, well, there were T-shirts also, posters, but T-shirts of Bin Laden outside the Indonesian parliament. So this is outside the Indonesian parliament, and uh, this is right when the message is being uh, broadcast on Al Jazeera, and this is taking place in Indonesia. Uh, some poor guys trying to make money from this. Okay, so this is a run-up to the war. On March 20th, the U.S. Launches war, launches war on Iraq, and Spain sends troops in August, and sends troops despite uh, polls saying that 90% of the Spanish people were against the war. Okay, so 90% of the Spanish people were against the war, but the government uh, sent uh, troops anyway. Now. In political theory terms, just very briefly, what happens is sovereignty rests in the hands of the people. During national elections, uh, the people hand over sovereignty to the elected government for a fixed term of, let's say, four years. And after that four years, sovereignty is handed back and it goes like that. Now, so when the Spanish people handed sovereignty to their prime minister, Aznar, um, in the first in the elections, and when uh, the war in Iraq breaks out, and Azna takes the troops into Iraq together with the U.S. against 90 percent of uh, the Spanish uh, population's will, in political theory terms, you can say that the Spanish people handed their sovereignty over the conduct of foreign affairs to their prime minister, and their prime minister in the specific instance of war in Iraq handed over that sovereignty um, to the American president, okay? So there is a transfer of sovereignty in regard to the war in Iraq in this instance in political theory terms. So let us look at now what happens when once the war gets launched. This is a week into the war. We have news reports coming out from Al Jazeera again in Qatar. And Al Jazeera showing you very graphic images of uh, casualties, civilian casualties in the war. You have many women, many children. Pretty grisly images. These images were by and large not seen on uh, American media, but they were definitely seen uh, in the Arab world through outlets like Al Jazeera. And such, such images um, inscribe in the minds of uh, Arabic-speaking populations uh, the extent of civilian casualties and the, the extent to which civilians were involved in this war. If we move back, if we move forward then, a year after uh, the start of the um, Iraq war, we then get back to where we started, the uh, Madrid train bombings. And let's look at a news report from the Madrid train bombings again. Here again we have uh, from the BBC report from the war and you see in this picture um, very clearly civilian casualties and there is in uh, the juxtaposition of these news reports between BBC and Al Jazeera uh, certain visual equivalence between what is going on in Madrid and what went on in Iraq a year later. And it is not surprising in the sense that um, Many of Al Jazeera's founding uh, journalists, in fact, 
uh, are ex-BBC reporters, BBC Arabic service reporters. So BBC and Al Jazeera are very close in terms of institutional culture, uh, reporting standards, and so on. So this now comes from the BBC, and it shows you civilian casualties in the bombing. What was the uh, Spanish popular response to this bombing? Immediately upon the bombing, within a day, two days, three days, you had huge demonstrations on Spanish streets. You had a demonstration in Madrid, which had maybe one, two million people. And across the country, it was estimated you had maybe uh, six million uh, people demonstrating over a number of days. So let's just look at some pictures from these demonstrations. A very strong theme emerges in the demonstrations, paz or peace. <clears throat> you had a football game within that uh, period between, um, between Barcelona and uh, Murcia, and here you have a well-known figure, Ronaldinho, who was playing for uh, Barcelona, Barcelona. No to terrorism, yes to peace, and this became a mantra among the Spanish people. No to terrorism, yes to peace. Another scene from a football game in which a spectator has run onto the playing pitch with the words, no to terrorism, yes to peace, written on his body. Policeman tries to stop him. Uh, Brazilian um, Spanish player uh, is protecting the civilian against the policeman. Paz, peace, paz, peace. So, it becomes quite evident that the uh, Spanish response to terrorism was no to terrorism, no to war, yes to peace. <clears throat> A few days later, then, the Spanish people indeed went to the polls and had the national elections. And as it turns out, the election results were a shock. It had been expected that Aznar's government, which had brought Spain into the war, would have won with a landslide majority, but as it turned out, they lost. And they lost to the loony left, the, the uh, socialists, who said, we'll take the troops out. So this is from the BBC. A country on course to reject the socialists has now voted them in. And then the BBC goes in to interview some of these uh, civilians. Let's just look briefly at these interviews. This person said uh, people are very angry, United said. We had hoped it would be the ETA, but it turns out it was an Islamic group. The people feel deceived by the government. Aznar has put people in danger by being involved in the war. <clears throat> Another person says Aznar was punished. This is about Iraq. It was um, <clears throat> Not so much that Zapatero won, but the government lost. Punishment for getting involved in a war the people didn't want. And as part of the BBC's um, attempt to be balanced judicious, they interviewed Aznar uh, supporters as well. And Aznar supporters, this one says, I've always voted for Aznar, but it was wrong to send troops to Iraq. Uh, I don't think the socialists will be better. I'm sorry Aznar uh, lost, but this is about Iraq, even though I'm sorry to hear that, uh, to see that Aznar lost. Again, a similar thing. Uh, I wanted Aznar to win. He was good. I don't know how good Zapatero, the socialist, will, will be, and the people who voted for the socialists will regret it. So there seems to be a strong consensus, one way or the other, who whomever you wanted to be in government, that this was about the Iraq war. <clears throat> now, as things turns out, turn out, then uh, it became clearer that there was an Islamic connection um, and that the government paid a price for saying that it was the Basques rather than the Islamists. Uh, and so as this thing developed, a consensus emerges also as to who was involved. And indeed, a week later, a group called the Abu Hafs al-Masri Brigades, which we hadn't heard from before, came out and claimed responsibility. 
And they said, praise to God and so on and so forth. We gave the Spanish people the choice between war and peace and they have chosen peace of their own will by electing the party which was against the war. In view of this, leadership has chosen to spend all operations in Spain. So now you have a group coming out and saying the Spanish people have spoken, we have heard the Spanish people and we respond uh, to what they have said, they have offered peace and we respond with peace. So this is a voice coming out now from nowhere. A month later, you have a familiar figure, Osama bin Laden, coming up again on Al Jazeera, uh, offering a truce, a peace treaty, to the Europeans. Okay, and now let's just listen again briefly. Oh, okay, sorry, right. Okay, right. Um, okay, just briefly, just to uh, give you a sense that this is the same person speaking who spoke uh, a few months ago, or sorry, a year ago in the run-up to the war. Let's just move on to the translation. So with the voice, we know that this is the same person who's speaking to us now, and he's saying that uh, this is a letter to our neighbors north of the Mediterranean incorporating a peace proposal. Okay, so he's coming up in the light of these events saying, yes, we will have a peace proposal. In what creed are your dead innocent but ours worthless? By what logic does your blood count as real and ours is no more than water? And then he goes on to say, so I present to them this peace proposal, which is essentially a commitment to cease operations against any state that pledges not to attack Muslims, okay? So is Bin Laden offering a peace proposal or is he only coming up to uh, ratify or to get on the a bandwagon which is already in motion? <clears throat> I won't go through all the other slides, but uh, we'll just, uh, just say that there was a response, um, again, hosted by Al Jazeera, in which uh, European intellectuals from various think tanks uh, spoke about the possibility of, of a peace treaty. It did not go very far, but uh, I just wanted to bring up this, this, um, the sequence of events and what it led to. This is the Al Jazeera uh, interview with a number of European um, intellectuals, policy makers, and so on. So I'd just like to end by repeating basically the questions they started off with, uh, which was, is it possible for civilians to have a role, to have a voice, to have standing in the conduct of foreign relations, in uh, ne the negotiations of international law? Uh, is it possible for civilians who have become involved in wars and in wars with states to now make peace? And this is, I think, my contribution to this um, conference, which is looking forward. Is it possible for civilians to have a role and to have a role in the making of peace? And through this set of events, um, we can ask the question, did the Spanish people make a peace treaty with uh, various Islamist uh, persons? Thank you. But I'd like to thank all those who have <clears throat> been members of my panel, and uh, true to my word, I've left myself five minutes in order to summarize what they've said and say something new. So let me be uh, very sparse. Uh, let me say that we heard from Dr. Marawi about a multiple piebald and above all global Muslim community. We heard from Professor Curzon about terrorists as a minority. 
uh, that does not represent the extensive one billion plus Muslim community. And we heard from Professor Cook that women are an important component of this Muslim community and they're involved in the war on terror, mostly opposing it and seeking alternatives via the World Wide Web, uh, satellite television and transnational networks. And now we just heard from Professor Eng Sang Ho, uh, not to be feared from Chicago, that the, the role of civilians in seeking uh, a solution to war is not to be downplayed, although it wasn't expected uh, before the war on terror, before, in fact, the, 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 the Spanish equivalent to 9-11, which is 3-11, and that he has shown uh, in his own uh, presentation how we cannot ignore those civilian voices. Some of you may be wondering where are the Shiite voices in all this, and I'm aware of the fact that I did not instruct my panelists to say um, the Shiites are here, the Shiites are back, we must pay attention to the Shiites. So let me in three minutes tell you that the Shiites are here, um, and I don't represent all of them. In fact, Professor Kurzman could have talked at length about Shiites in Iran, on which he's written extensively. But let me say that in my own writing and my own reflection, uh, the Shiite uh, Sunni controversy, which is often highlighted, um, is not something which can be gainsaid. It does have long and deep historical roots. But at the same time, the way in which it's been politicized today is something rather new. And we have to pay attention not, I think, to the long historical corridor going back, as it were, to the seventh century and retelling the origins of the beginning of the Muslim community and the Shi-Sunni divergence, but rather the way, again, to paraphrase Professor Kurzman, given these historical differences between Shiites and Sunnis, one might be reasonably expected to ask the question, why have there not been more, even more flagrant uh, uh, altercations and acts of violence between Sunnis and Shiites if, in fact, they have this deep historical hatred? And I would like to just throw out as my single provocation that there is, and no one can deny, a Sunni-Shiite divide, but given the intensity with which it's been um, expressed in recent times, one has to also marvel at the fact that there have been restraining voices and that there has not been, uh, there may be a civil war in Iraq, but it is not defined only along Sunni-Shiite lines. So with that, uh, I'm close to 1015. And I promised you that I would stop in order to allow questions, but that you would also get a break for 15 minutes. So our, our presentations are done, and now it's your chance to ask us questions. And of course, I won't answer any questions, but I will direct them all to my panelists. Um, Yes, I, I'm not sure to whom this really should be directed, perhaps primarily to Professor Kurzman, um, but, but to any. Um, assuming uh, the uh, opposition and indeed the horror of the vast majority of Muslims to Islamic terrorism and extremism, uh, are we then receiving a very strong and reliable stream of intelligence to help us uh, identify the bad guys and to uh, operate against them. Uh, that's above my classification. Uh, it's my security clearance level uh, to know whether we're, w how these intelligence matters are working. My guess would be that, uh, that uh, Muslim uh, uh, governments in Muslim majority countries are getting this intelligence. Uh, one of the things that's striking about uh, Islamic groups in uh, almost every country in the world is how small uh, their cells are, that they can't really meet uh, collectively in groups larger than uh, a handful because they will be, uh, 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 the, the uh, local governments become aware of them. Uh, and so that the places where they, they tend to get larger are places where they're either uh, sharing uh, in government have taken over government responsibilities and have territory. So I would say places like Gaza, uh, other parts of the West Bank, parts of southern Lebanon, but generally places where the states can't reach. So we find uh, Islamist revolutionaries organizing in places that, that are extremely remote. So northwest Pakistan would count as such an area. Um, the, uh, the the group in, uh, in um, the Philippines is often um, blanking on the name, uh, uh, bl in these jungle islands, very remote spots, uh, parts of the Sahel region. Uh, again, the, the remotest possible areas. 
uh, where states don't reach. And I think that's because they've been driven off into the mountains and jungles by governments that have been all too effective uh, using, overreaching often, uh, sweeps that bring in many people who are innocent. Uh, and as a result, yes, I, I think, in other words, I think intelligence is being offered, whether directly to the U.S. government, I don't know, but it appears to be offered to these, to these uh, local governments. Hello, I'm just a regular citizen um, who watches Christian <coughs> television uh, on the 700 Club about five months ago. Uh, they said uh, that the president of Iran is a member of an organization composed of one million um, men in Iran whom he uses as his secret police who I'm not exactly sure the spelling of this organization is called the B-E-G-I-Z. Do you know that organization? Uh, and they are uh, a million men who have sworn martyrdom uh, to overthrow the West in the United States. Um, I, I don't know, but that's an awful lot of people. Um, and it's a very powerful man. So I didn't know whether you knew about them or not. Yes, or, sure. Uh, figure from the 700 Club. Yeah. <laughs> I knew yeah. that was coming. <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, Ahmadinejad is, is uh, a, a loose cannon by anybody's criteria and uh, has, um, uh, yes, th there is an organization that is supposedly signing up martyrs uh, and they have a web page uh, <coughs> in Iran. Uh, it's worth noting that there have been no <coughs> Iranian terrorists in recent years. So this is something that's a fear for the future, but not something we've seen uh, in recent years. Now, I gather there is evidence that some Iranians have been assisting uh, various uh, terrorist activities in Iraq. And I think this is part of the proxy war that we're currently fighting with Iran in Iraq. Uh, but that's, that's the, the idea that Iranians are going to flood across their borders in all directions uh, and, and, uh, and kill us. Uh, I think is extremely remote. Um, they, uh, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine how they would do that, how they would do it undetected, um, and how they would be able to mobilize people. The, the, the numbers that they signed up on this, through this organization that was asking for people to sign up to be martyrs, was embarrassingly low, to so the point where they, uh, they started to downplay it. It was originally a big PR stunt. And they, they, after a couple months, realized that not enough people were signing up. And so they stopped publicizing it in the, the, the pro-government uh, uh, newspapers. So uh, I don't know where the million figure comes from. My guess is that this is uh, being propagated by uh, uh, Iranian exile groups that want to overthrow the Iranian government and, and that uh, they have a certain credibility because they're Iranian. But they're, as we saw with Iraqi dissident, groups, uh, sometimes motivated to feed information to us that feeds our fears, but may, may not be rooted in, in actual fact. That said, I, I don't know uh, and can't possibly rule it out. I don't have yeah. information. To the Dr. Marawi wants to say some response to that question. And let me just say that uh, in, the, in the paper, which I had intended to give, um, and I spared you, I did have one principal point, and that is the difference between propaganda and actual um, hostile activities. And I would say that if one thing that uh, is very clear about many parts of the Middle East and Iran would be uh, sp especially true for this statement, uh, propaganda does not always equal action. And so uh, when you listen to something such as this in 700 Club, remember that repeating their propaganda doesn't mean it's an actual threat. It just means that their propaganda is getting through. <laughs> well, uh, the, the Basij group that, that you mentioned is part of a larger group called the, the, uh, the, the Guardians of the, the Islamic Revolution in Iran and along with another group called the Quds, also very influential. Uh, but the numbers that, that, that I've seen is 350,000. But that includes really they are not, they are, they are almost like formal military, even though they don't, they are not considered as the national uh, uh, army of, of Iran. So the numbers are really more like 350, and they have their own uh, air force, their own uh, uh, army and stuff, but it's, the numbers are much lower than that. Other questions? Yes, please. Yes, Terry Henderson. I, I do buy the premise that relative to as many Muslims as there are in the world, that this is a small number. Talk to us a little bit about 
since that religion is so decentralized and there are numerous spokesmen out there, um, we hear the term hijacked. The religion has been hijacked in some ways. How has that been possible and how has that gained such um, currency in, in the world's thinking, or at least the United States thinking, about the religion having been hijacked? And how has that been possible? Well, there are lots of people who could ask that question. Uh, I, I, Eng Seng, why don't you say something? Then, uh, Charlie, you, you might come up. But Eng Seng, you want to say something about that? The hijacking of Islam? Um, well, I guess um, to put in the context of um, this question of the hijacking of Islam, I guess Islam. Um, Islam poses similar issues to what I uh, spoke about this morning about the role of civilians in uh, international relations in the sense that we often say that um, there is no Islamic church and no Islamic clergy. So the issue of uh, the relation between church and state uh, in Islamic societies is um, not a clear one. I think if you, if you take this idea that the relation between church and state is not a clear one, then the um, participation of Muslims in relations between states is even more blurry. So I think um, the fact that for a start, the, the notion that the religion does not have proper representation or democratic representation within um, the, the, within the structures of Islamic majority nations, number one, um, amplifies the problem that Muslim civilians do not have um, standing or representation in the conduct of relations between states. So I think that compounds the, the problem. And so many of the uh, actions of what we call non-state actors today who are Muslims take place in this, I would say, um, lack of institutionalized structures of representation. So we have uh, Dr. Malawi also speak. Charlie, do you want to speak before or after? Just, uh, you, you refer to the fact that, uh, that uh, Islam is a decentralized uh, faith and that, uh, that there is no single arbiter of what is Islamic and what isn't. Uh, and there's uh, tens of thousands of seminary trained religious scholars, uh, each of whom has the right uh, in, under Islamic tradition to, to judge uh, whether a particular act is or is not in keeping with uh, uh, the sacred scriptures. Now that, that uh, number has been now swamped by a huge number of educated people with modern education uh, who, who are now engaging in uh, theological and juris religious jurisprudential questions uh, in a sense as, as do-it-yourself theologians, that these are autodidacts who are college educated. Uh, over the last two generations, the number of college educated Muslims uh, all around the world has gone up tremendously. And uh, many of them are saying, well, why can't I, if I can read Arabic, why can't I go back to the sacred sources and figure out what they mean? And they're doing that. And this is a massive movement that is feeding not only uh, uh, people like bin Laden, who has a, a civilian education, has no extensive seminary training, and yet claims the right to issue fatwas, uh, that is religious judgments, uh, and is also fueling the rise of what I've called liberal Islamic movements, um, where you get civil engineers and um, lawyers and philosophers and, and uh, professionals, again, without seminary training, claiming that what Islam truly means is, uh, say, democracy or tolerance or multi-ethnic, uh, uh, multi-religious coexistence. Both of these trends are being fueled by the rise of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the rise of secular education, higher education, and the breakdown of the monopoly or near monopoly, the oligopoly perhaps that that uh, seminaries used to have on deciding what is Islamic. So, I'm sorry, was there yeah, very quick. Was there yeah, I think th th this is really a central problem within, within Islam, <coughs> especially Sunni Islam. I'm not talking about, about Shias. The, the absence of central authority where there is this, this anarchy of fatwas, various <coughs> interpretations from radical to moderate. And I think the, the, the point of an Islamic renewal or reformation that I was talking about is precisely how to codify all of these institutions, how to, to, to centralize the authority of Islam. 
So there are two paradoxical things going on at the same time. One is that in a way there's much more of, of a democracy that there is people or anarchy, people giving their opinions with the globalization and, and, uh, and uh, at the same time the, the Islam being used and monopolized by the state, by the nation state to legitimate authority. So it is a response to that kind of manipulation of, of, of Islam by the, uh, the authoritarian states. And in my view, I think there is a need for serious rethinking within Islamic principles and texts about this question of authority. Dr. Cook also has a follow-up. I, I know you have a follow-up. She has to say something, then you can say something, then we'll ask another question, and then we'll have a break. Um, actually, to respond to what you're saying, I think there's a lot of rethinks, rethinking that's going on. The Organization for the Modernization of Islamic Thought, for example, I think there's, there's a lot that's going on. But I think that um, we have to consider what's going on, let's say, just in the Arab world, and that is a crisis in the wake of um, colonialism and wars of independence. So that um, within the Arab countries themselves, there is a sense of, of absolute crisis and not knowing um, how to go forward. And one thing that has been successful has been Islam as rhetoric and ideology, but also effective on the ground has been the way in which Islamists, Islamic fundamentalists, have been recruiting people out of um, conditions of, of despair, particularly in contexts where the government does not provide social goods. Um, this comes out again and again, my work is in uh, literature and cultural production, in, uh, in films, in literature, but you can see this also on the ground, that um, Islam, Islamic groups, Islamist groups, are um, extremely effective in, um, in recruiting the, uh, the, the, uh, the disempowered. And that's something that, um, as, I, as I was saying before, women and um, people within the society recognize the, um, the attraction and the danger of Islamist ideology. I know you don't want another, another answer, and I'm not going to give you another one. I'm just going to make one point that my paper was going to be about Pakistan, uh, fall 2005, the earthquakes in Kashmir, the responses of governments, international governments, even the New York Fire Department had a great response to it. But the one that's remembered is the Islamic charities who were there first with doctors, with aid and everything. And they were able to co-op the majority sentiment even though others provided help. So that's just to say that hijacking Islam goes on at lots of levels and earthquakes can be one of the causes. So you have a follow-up question, go ahead. I think, I think one couldn't say it more succinctly than that. And I'm going to have one more question, and then we are going to have the break. Yes, uh, just look at this gentleman first. So My question is, uh, you've got it. You've got to be on phone. Uh, you've got to be on phone, or it won't be recorded, and it won't happen. How can we help the women of, of Islam overcome this attraction? Oh, um, it's, it's not so much the women who are being attracted into these movements, but rather the men, because these are very much men Men, uh, men's organizations. There are a few um, Islamist women's, um, well, uh, organizations of um, Muslim women, pietistic um, organizations, but all of them are very anti-violence. My, my question was, how can we help the women overcome that? Oh, I thought you, okay. Um, well, I, I think that um, it's really important um, for our government to um, try to make connections with um, these progressive women's organizations. Um, I was involved in a, um, a meeting with uh, Liz Cheney and some uh, people from the CIA and US and the um, Department of State. And the, um, their 
um, question to us, or a group of us who, who um, deal with um, women in Islam, was um, who are the organizations with which we might um, partner? And um, unfortunately, I don't think it went anywhere. But I think that's the right th that's the right way to go, and to um, not to impose agendas onto these organizations, but rather to enlist their help as uh, as consultants, um, like Riverbend in Baghdad burning. These are these are women who are have the pulse of the street. And it's their brothers, fathers, sons, who are um, are the ones in the um, Islamist movements, and they are the ones that I think um, are going to be the most helpful. Scott. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, as he said, better than I could, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a 15-minute break now before we start our second panel with uh, Professor Kuhnholm. So join me in thanking.